Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to again to the webinars at NUS to held today. Uh, we have a good number of people here. I'd like to thank all of you for being able to join us this afternoon. So my name is Tong Yenwa. I'm from the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at NUS and also uh, in the NUS Environment Research, Research, uh, Environment Research Institute uh, that is organizing this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker for today, Dr. Yao Zi and Dr. Kadiam Babu for being able to give the talk. Now, before we invite them to give the presentation this afternoon, uh, if we we will like to be ask you to put in your questions or comments if you do have any after or before or after the end of the presentation into the Q and A box. So please do type in your questions there, and if you do see something a question that others have asked, you can upload it, and we will ask the questions to both Dr. Yao and Dr. Babu. All right, so uh, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Yao and Dr. Babu. They are the co-founders of uh, the company Carbon for a Better Environment, CBE, and they, uh, Dr. Yao have been working in this area, uh, did his PhD under Professor Wang Chiwa at NUS, and after that he worked with Prof Professor Wang for the, for the past few years. So he's still with us and we're happy to have him. And so has Dr. Babu. Uh, Dr. Babu worked uh, joined the US and worked with Prof Wang also. All right, I won't take up too much time. So let us welcome Dr. Yao and Dr. Babu to give the presentation for this afternoon. Please. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Prof. You. Uh, good afternoon. We are CB Eco Solutions. We are a spin off company from NUS. I'm Yao Zhi. I'm the co founder and CEO of the company. Hi, I am Babu. I'm the CTO for this company. I'm a material chemist. So today we will jointly present our project, which is to upcycle the industrial waste, carbon waste, into high value products. So first of all, I will give a uh, Introduction of the project background, followed by the R&D work that have been conducted in our team, which is to convert the industrial carbon waste into vanadium products and carbon products. In the last part, I will share with you our journey from lab scale R&D all the way to commercialization. So here is the issue. So nowadays, the oil refineries are trying to meet the global low sulfur fuel requirements, and they are also trying to improve the yield of transportation fuels. To maximize the profit margin, they are adopting a gasification process, which is to further break down the heavy hydrocarbons into thin gas, which consists of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The thin gas could be used as a chemical feedstock. It can also be used for the desulfurization process. Although the gasification process is able to recycle the value from oil refinery bottom, it also generates a byproduct, the carbonaceous residue, which contains high concentration of heavy metals. So currently, people just burn it off as a waste and send the remaining ash for landfill. This practice causes several environmental issues, such as greenhouse gas emissions, potential toxicity to the environment. And taking Singapore for example, the Samarkand Island, which is the only landfill site in Singapore, will run out of space by 2035. In addition, oil refineries have to pay huge amounts of money and a gate fee for the disposal of the carbon waste. So here we can see there are two, quite two issues, environmental issue and economic issues. Instead of burning and landfill, we want to recycle the carbon waste and turn it to something useful. As you can see from the table on the right-hand side, the carbon waste contains 30% of carbon, 67% of moisture, and roughly 2% of heavy metals. Among these heavy metals, vanadium has the highest concentration. So 
we aim to recover carbon and palladium from the carbon waste and further convert them into carbon products and palladium products, respectively. Once we have developed the synthesized rule for, for our product, we will further optimize our process so that it has the, the most cost effective recovery process. And then we will further scale up our process from lab scale to pilot scale so that we can prove that our solutions are commercially viable using the pilot scale plant. Our ultimate goal is to realize the commercialization of our technologies and products. So our first work is the recovery of palladium. So there are various oxidation status of a palladium. So palladium pentoxide is the most important industrial palladium compound. It has various applications. Palladium is mainly used for the manufacturing of alloys, steel alloys. Palladium steel allows, uh, allows reduced weight and with increasing tensile strength. In addition, Vanadium pentoxide is also commercially used as a catalyst for the production of sulfuric acid. In this reaction, the sulfur dioxide will be oxidized into sulfur trioxide and the vanadium pentoxide placed as a role of a catalyst. Vanadium pentoxide is also used in the manufacturing of ceramics. And uh, in addition, the, the vanadium flow, uh, redox flow batteries for energy applications is also going to be a, a very important in the future for the energy storage applications. Because, because of its extremely large capacity, it is well suited for the large scale energy storage applications. So we have already uh, developed our first technology to recycle and uh, convert the palladium pentoxide from the carbon waste. At the first step, we are using a chemical reagent to separate heavy metals from the carbon waste. And after, separate, after the filtration, we get the heavy metal leachate. Then we, we further selectively extract and precipitate palladium pentoxide precursor. And the palladium pentoxide crystals will be produced by some further thermochemical treatment. As you can see from figure one, it's the XID pattern of our palladium pentoxide products and the commercial palladium pentoxide. Both of them uh, exhibit uh, the same representative peaks in accordance to palladium pentoxide. And based on our ICP results, uh, the, the purity of palladium pentoxide is calculated to be 99% and above. And the figure B and the C are the SEM images of palladium pentoxide uh, uh, crystals. So this uh, vanadium pentoxide crystal has a structure of row-like structure with the average and with the average length of seven micrometer and an average uh, diameter of one micrometer. And actually, this this crystal could be further converted to two D vanadium pentoxide nano sheets by further hydrothermal treatment. So, uh, figure D and figure E are the SEM images of the vanadium pentoxide nanosheets. Because of its high surface area, vanadium pentoxide nanosheets are well suited for energy storage applications. And its uh, lateral dimension could be uh, is, uh, roughly several hundred micrometers. So one of the application of the vanadium pentoxide is the supercapacitor. As shown in figure E, figure A, so vanadium pentoxide was blended with super peak uh, carbon black and a lay film at the mass ratio of eight to one to one. The mixture is further pasted on carbon fabrics as electrodes. And the, uh, the symmetric uh, yeah, supercapacitor were fabricated by sandwiching the gas fiber capacitor uh, separator between two palladium pentoxide electrodes. Figure B shows that through so the cyclic uh, voltometry curves of the waste derived vanadium pentoxide supercapacitor at, at various gain rates. And uh, this supercapacitor was able to be bent reversibly and uh, it demonstrated similar uh, cyclic voltometry curves on the different bending rates. 
So which means it is highly flexible and it's highly stable on the different bending angles. And also the galvanostatic charge and discharge curve at different charge and discharge rates are shown in figure D. The cycling test revealed that 80% of its initial capacitance remain after 30, after 3000 charge discharge circles as shown in figure E. To highlight the importance of producing the radium pentyl oxide from the carbon waste, we have conducted the environmental impact analysis. So on both conventional methods and waste derived method, conventional method use stone coal as a raw material for the production of radium pentyl oxide. Due to the lack of the data in the literature, this study only cover the synthesized process from the raw material all the way to radium pentyl oxide crystals. And uh, you can see from the figure, so there are totally six steps in the conventional method and three steps for our waste derived method. And also the system, the system boundaries are also showing these figures. So here's the results of the environmental impact analysis. Here we have an, analyzed the three endpoint damage categories, damage to human health, damage to ecosystem, and damage to resource availability. The results of environmental impact analysis on both conventional measures and a waste derived measure shows that the number of steps and the overall environmental impact of waste derived measures are significantly lower than the ones with conventional methods. And then we are in the in detail, the waste derived method can achieve up to 61% savings on human health and ecosystem diversity, and 39% savings on resource availability. Now I will hand over the microphone to Dr. Babu to, to introduce uh, the recovery of carbon from the carbon waste. Hi, good afternoon. And my friend already said, there are two materials we are recovering from the carbon waste. One is vanadium, the other one is carbon material. In this carbon waste, they contain the carbon is full of uh, nanoparticles. The nanoparticles on the surface is very less, it's less than 300 nanometers per gram only. What is this carbon waste already? It's a gasification product. This carbon contains full of heavy metals, 1% of heavy metals in the oxide form. And it is very difficult to remove the oxide because oxide is highly stable. So we need very harsh treatment to remove the heavy metals. So they currently they are using some acids, strong acids, sulfuric acid, and high concentration to remove these heavy metals because the cost is very high and the environmental concern is also very uh, because of the hazardous nature of the acid. So they are sending this carbon waste to incineration plant. What we do is we use some leaching agent which is non-hazardous and it will remove the heavy metals fully and make the carbon to 99% pure. Once the carbon is 99% pure and it contains pure of carbon without very few 0.01% of heavy metals, that heavy metals is not a problem and we can dispose into the uh, landfill is not a problem. So after it is removing the heavy metal, the carbon, the, we can say it as carbon X, it's a leached carbon. But this carbon has no porosity and the surface area is be very less. So what we do, we we have the own we are we are formulated the catalyst and the catalyst is an inorganic complex material because of the pattern we can, we couldn't reveal that uh, what catalyst is this. So our catalyst will enhance the surface area by increasing the porosity and also not only the surface area but also the increase in the functional groups over the carbon. This both plays the major role for the adsorption of heavy metals and uh, organic pollutants. Example, if we have only a uh, surface area, then it, it won't be useful. Even because for the specificity of the adsorption of heavy metals, we need the functional groups over the carbon. So our catalyst will do the bolt. But in commercial way, they use it for the activation above 800 degrees Celsius. But in our process, we use less than 400 degrees Celsius. And catalyst is also 1 is to 5 ratio. It's very less only we are using. After the activating the catalyst, after using the activation step, we are getting highly porous activated carbon with functional groups. You can see in the results of elemental analysis, in the carbon waste, the carbon uh, percent is 87, and the carbon X, the leached carbon we used to say carbon X, it is 84, and the, after the activation, we use our material acid as carbon SP. 
and this carbon sp is 85.22 percentage what this really means friends currently if they go for the activation by using the normal procedure the carbon content will reduce because of the oxidation will convert to the co2 but in our process the co2 production will be very less which clearly shows the elemental reserve and another thing the morphology basically this carbon is a soot particle it will be like a very nano form you can see from the same image it's all been a spherical form and uh, it is very rough also to make into the porous is very difficult in the same image you can, you can, can clearly see this particles in the three form one is spherical form and linear chain and branched chain after this the spherical particles individual spherical particles uh, don't play any role in the uh, porosity and surface area but this linear chain and the branched chain figure a and b it can play it, it is the only this from this uh, chain this morphology only we can use it for the uh, porosity after the activation the the surface, surface area increases because of the linear and branched chain in morphology of this material now it's clearly uh, uh, replicate in the surface area uh, textural properties of the uh, material so here you can see the leached carbon after the leach, uh, the first the raw material is leached with the uh, treatment as a treatment then the surface area was 410.32 meters square per gram but after the activation the surface area increased to the double it increased to 820.19 meters square per gram and the same time the pore volume and pore diameter also increased which means our catalyst loose on the uh, porosity will increase because of the some oxidation it's not only because of the catalyst it includes both the catalyst and the uh, heating temperature because that's what we say our uh, our, our the process is based on both physical uh, not chemical pro chemical process and physical process this we find a pattern when we use this for the absorption of, of uh, organic dyes we can see in the figure the rhodamin b the absorption capacity was increased for the activated carbon when compared to the leached carbon uh, because now we can use the organic molecules as the model pollutant for the absorption studies currently they are using for methylene blue and rhodamin b and the iodine test for my uh, micropores so now we can see in the methylene blue absorption capacity was uh, it's double when compared to the carbon the carbon based is 50.45 but after the leached carbon is 89 once with the activation it increases to 120.07 i think this is the most sufficient and material we can sell this carbon and to the market that's why we came both after this rhodamin also uh, rhodamin b absorption also increased and one more thing and uh, the number of recycles retention efficiency efficiency we are calculated we are studied was the we did and the retention efficiency after the six cycles it was very less by using we can use any um, dilute solution of uh, hydrochloric acid sodium hydroxide ammonia um, ammonium chloride the ammonium chloride shows the more regeneration efficiency greater than 85% and then we tested it for industrial wastewater effluent uh, effluent and you can see the colors the first one the there is no there is no carbon the second one is we used the leached carbon and the third one is used the carbon sp our acted our product and we used the fourth one is a commercial uh, acted carbon you can see the after the uh, after the uh, some time the color changes to slight very light and because of the absorption of the uh, organic moieties present in the control so then it clearly shows in aerobic process the absorption capacity for the chemical oxidation demand and total organic carbon of leached carbon has been increased to 62% and 23% after the uh, using our activated carbon carbon sp think we can and one more thing we can nearly compete with the commercial activated uh, carbon psc you can see the 0.157 mg per gram ml per gram per mg so with both our uh, uh the the orange color shows our carbon sp and the commercial one is in the gray color we all almost compete with the commercial one so this makes a more advantage for us to enter into the market with our carbon sp and now the another material uh not already we said we extract the carbon from the waste and we want to try this carbon for various application because we are a startup company we need more materials to enter into the various fields 
so another one is this carbon nanoparticles we can use it in the uh, electrode for the super capacitors because already graphene graphite so many things are there but we have the carbon we have this carbon nanoparticles it contains some of sp2 hybrid carbon and sp3 carbon once if we go for the a more a strong oxidation treatment the sp2 carbon will go become sp3 then the conductivity will be reduced but that's why before the oxidation we want to maintain more of sp2 because it contains a lot of electrons the flow of electrons induces the uh, electrode capacity is very good so that's why we you we we structured a uh, crumpled structure and uh, with a polymer so this act as a core electrode and after that we can coat it with the gold and we can go for the super capacitor test i i can simply i can tell what we how we did we used the polyvinyl alcohol and mixed it with our carbon black into that and we formed a planar nano coating material then this ink the uh, the ink is coated over the substrate it's a thermally sensitive substrate it's a polymer one once we coated it we coated onto the thermally active polymer substrate after that we go for annealing at the temperature around 100 to 140 after the annealing we get this crumpled structure this crumpled structure uh, after the crumpled structure we go we uh, inject the elastomer into the top layer we uh, top layer where the carbon black and the pv is present after the elastomer uh, infiltration we remove the substrate a thermally conductive substrate and we form the thermally con- uh, conductive uh, bilayer film we form this can be used for the electrode application and what about uh, this film it the resistivity uh, decreases for this film and the shrinking because of the shrinking capacity the electron flow of electron will be increased and the charge the current density increases three times when compared to the planar or uh, structure we we just uh, compared with the planar structure and the crumpled structure and uh, the planar structure has a 3 amps per meter square but and the uh, crumpled structure it has 12 amps per meter square so you can be used it for the we are trying to make it as a commercial one but because of the cost we are trying to reduce the cost to make it more viable for the market and the same thing this crumpled structure can be act as a fire protection also because of this crumpled structure the oxygen permeability into because during the fire at uh, the flame of flame the oxygen is a major role plays a major role because of this this crumpled structure the oxygen cannot enter into the easily and the uh, the fire won't be catch that much easily it, it can withstand for more than uh, 90 seconds we tried uh, with a model um, a model studies and it was very uh, strong when compared to the planar or and the bare uh, polymer and further one more application we used uh, some uh, fluorosilanes to coat over the material and make it as a water repellent nano coating and these are the Uh, multi-function carbon nanoparticles we are developed by using this carbon based all this material the major thing is the porosity plays a major role not only the sp2 carbon uh, sp2 carbon the porosity plays a vital role that's why we need to uh, increase the porosity and function groups over this carbon or carbon for this this material and another application of our carbon sp once we are now we are for uh, another one is the application is for the absorption of oil oils and uh, solvents present solvents so we are using to make this by using this carbon sp as a aerogel and super hydrophobic egg uh, for obesity now previously i said uh, if we if you do the oxidation step and uh, if you make more porous and the most of the sp2 convert to sp3 and we get lot of functional groups these functional groups increase the polarity of the carbon and it will be miscible with the uh the conductivity will be of the reduced but for the super hydrophobicity we no need any co- uh, functional groups for the our carbon so we use our own technology to we use some detection media reducing agent to reduce the functional groups over the carbon and make it as a, it's just like the uh, graphene oxide to reduce graphene oxide we reduce the all the functional groups then we mix it with the uh, polyvinyl alcohol precursor and we go for free freeze casting and lyophilization then we get the uh, aerogel this aerogel is a super hydrophobic when we treat it a uh, very less amount of uh, skillin material coated over with this uh, carbon now we can see uh, we used a, a different composition of uh, carbon with a polyvinyl alcohol to increase the uh, super hydrophobicity and we found that after uh, we compared it with a uh, pure pva 
cilin uh, cilin coated polyvinyl alcohol aerogel with cilin coated polyvinyl alcohol with uh, carbon or with carbon sp material we found that the carbon sp presented aerogel increases the super hydrophobicity and it shows 156.7 the contact angle which clearly shows the super hydrophobicity and another the the figure c and d we can easily clearly can show we immerse our aerogel into the water which contains some solvents and it's uh, coming out because of the very light weight now we can clearly show the adsorption studies of the carbon aerogel uh, we used the, the sudan 3 dyed mineral oil and you can see the picture a and the it's absorbing oil all in the c and c and b and c you can see the absorption occurs and after d if you can it, it fully remove the oil from the uh, solution and in the other figure you can see uh, comparing the adsorption studies with the polyvinyl alcohol and with polyvinyl alcohol with carbon you can see the adsorption capacity for the polyvinyl alcohol with carbon increased when compared to the polyvinyl alcohol for the almost for all the materials mineral oil soybean oil vegetable oil silicone oil exane dmf and ethanol the ethanol shows very little bit because ethanol it will be miscible with most polar and non polar solvents that's why it shows very little but the composite aerogel and exhibit an adsorption capacity of 30 times its original weight and it could be reused repeatedly and we can uh, recover through by simple drying process this on one another application of our carbon material uh, the next one uh, already as he said in the vanadium flow battery uh, there we record vanadium and used as a electrolyte of for the vanadium flow batteries now the another uh, of course uh, redox flow battery is the a uh, persian blue used as an electrolyte it's just like that the same thing where it in a vanadium it is a 5 plus 2 4 plus and 3 plus 2 2 plus the same thing here the ferro and peri will play the um, play the electrolyte here the persian blue will act as the fe3 in the cathode shell the oxidation will take place fe2 plus to become fe3 plus and then the redox and the reduction during the discharge the fe2 plus leaves the one electron and becomes fe3 plus that's a simple thing here what our carbon we are mixing because Uh, in the vanadium flow battery the vanadium is a heavy metal and it's a major problem and the cost wise is very difficult and in the vanadium flow battery we need some ph because under highly acidic ph only it will enter but this persian blue they can use in the normal ph also and it's not that much uh, uh, costly also and it's environmentally it's also safe and compared to the vanadium so we are trying to approach in this vanadium flow in this redox flow battery also our carbon product we are using as additive to mix with this uh, this uh, persian blue because of the porosity and the electron conductivity here the electron can uh, carry over to the uh, carbon and can the storage capacity increases you can see in the image in the figure after uh, the black dot indicating the charging capacity and the red dot indicating the discharge capacity in the fifth cycle if you add our carbon the utilization rate will be increased 8 points on percent the persian blue uh, the the rate of the active material uh, our carbon acts as a support and the ion the electrons can flow into the support and it will increase the charge capacity but the same thing we had in the next figure our carbon black uh, it's, it's a commercially black we had it and the carbon it's improved only by 8% even in the compared to the market available carbon black ours increased 8.7 percentage i we feel it's purely based on the porosity and the functional group even if we can modify the porosity because the porosity micro porosity and meso porosity plays a role if we mod if we can even more to modify the meso porosity micro porosity and the functional groups we can even we can increase is the charge capacity we are thinking that's another application then uh, basically always uh, the carbon base Uh, apply, uh, getting from the uh, uh, refineries, the main problem is that the toxicity is there. Toxicity because they will tell because there is a lot of heavy metals, mostly transition heavy metals is present in that one. So we need to give our uh, customers we tell our material is very safe. So for that we studied uh, two cell line, F F E two cell line and M R C five cell line. I we can see that in the figure. The viability of M R C five and F E two cells were affected by the carbon black waste. There is a pure carbon black. it contains heavy metals uh, and it shows the cell viability decreases very far or uh, uh, by various concentration when we used we used uh, we tested with our carbon sp the cell viability is not decreased that much 
yeah all this almost 80% above 80% in the cellular availability is present even that i may be that 10 15% is due to the minute percent of heavy metal present in the carbon fb so we can say our carbon fb is most uh, i think we can go we can use it for the commercial one uh, then another so that uh, so far i tell the carbon is derived from the petroleum based now recently and the carbon was produced from the chicken uh, the biochar produced from chicken manure it's uh, it's increasing lot of uh, opportunities in singapore we have the collaboration with one of the uh, companies they are producing 5 tons per day what they do is they are using the animal manure and they do for the gasification in the gasification they get their biochar and the syngas the syngas they use for electricity and chemical fuels this biochar they are simply the dumping and they are going for incineration plant because this biochar containing lot of metals here how the metals are coming means because the uh, during the feeding the they are using some medicine the feed stock because of feed stock they are getting the heavy metal contents once if we go for the biochar the metal all the metals the converted metal oxide again it will make a problem to remove to remove that metals from this biochar now we can see the uh, composition in this composition almost uh, the calcium aluminum iron potassium and the magnesium uh, so many metals are in even when compared to the petroleum waste the metal contents are very high so we we came with the process flow chart this is a simple structure because we are not going to this time we are not going to remove the metals after the gasification we are going to remove the metals before the gasification So in the chicken manure, in the dry chicken, wet chicken manure, in the chicken manure, the metals are all in the soluble form. I think by changing the pH parameter and the condition, we can remove the most of the highly toxic heavy metals. After the high, if we remove the highly toxic heavy metals, it will contain uh, calcium, aluminium, iron, silicon only. I think it's not a big problem for the environment. So we can then if we, if we can go for the gasification, we can get the biochar. It contains calcium, iron. and silica so it so then we can go for activation pattern process we can find we can get the porous carbon which present calcium oxide iron oxide and aluminum oxide with a major content so this can be used for different applications one we can go for the adsorbent for the heavy metals for the specific heavy metals and the, because of the calcium oxide with the carbon porous carbon we can use it for the co2 capture and another one this calcium iron and aluminum both are, the all the three elements are in uh, construction uh, application so we can directly give our material uh, for the construction application now we are almost we are get some good we got some good yeah. results and we are going to speak with our customers these are the potential application for this material low end and high volume application for this uh, chicken manure one, one can be construction and another can be for activated carbon in waste water treatment another by producing syngas Another one is high end and low volume application. Is hydrogen production, CO2 capture, and adsorbent for specific compounds, metals like arsenic, selenium, chromium, and organic molecules. Uh, now, thank you. I give my now my friend will continue and he'll tell about the commercial journey of our uh, process. So yeah, my, let me share with you our journey from lab scale R and D to all the way to commercialization. In year 2017, I joined Samco NUS Corporate Lab. This is a, a, a the lab. Uh, this is a, a five-year research program jointly invested by National Research Foundation, Samco, and NUS. And uh, in this program, me, I and my colleague Babu had developed the first technology, which is to recover carbon from the carbon waste. And we were trying to find to explore the applications of the purified carbon. So in year 20, 2018, we joined the uh, Ning Launchpad Singapore program. So in the program, we have further gained valuable business acumen, but we are still struggling to, to come up with a sustainable business plan for our technology. So year, in year 2019, we joined NUS Group. NUS Group has provided us a strong support in terms of uh, uh, business mentorship Uh, R&D collaboration, intellectual network, and uh, the funding support. And also during the, this time, we have further developed our technology. We have further improved the porosity, the porosity of the carbon, making it more porous, so that it could be used as a active carbon. 
In parallel, we also develop our technology to recover the vanadium from the carbon waste and further convert it into uh, vanadium pentoxide. So in year 2020, we incorporate our own spin off company called CB Eco Solutions. So this is our founding team. Our team have, has more than 20 years of research and business experience with a strong market network in China, India, and Indonesia. I got my PhD from chemical and biomolecular engineering from NUS. I have like seven years of research experience in process design and optimization for the waste to resolve process. Dr. Babu is the CTO of the company. He got his PhD from chemistry. chemistry. And uh, he has more than eight years of research experience in the synthesis of inorganic materials. Avi Salim is our COO. He's, he got his MBA from NUS and now he's doing MPA in Harvard. Our scientific advisor is Professor Wang Qihua. He is a full professor in chemical and biomolecular engineering department in NUS. He has more than 10 years of research experience in in the field of energy and the environment, and he has more than 260 journal publications. So, as we mentioned before, so our company specialized in converting oil refinery carbon waste to value added products. We have two products activated carbon and a vanadium pentoxide. So, based on the historical data, the oil refinery industry is still expanding at 6%, which means in the future, we can foresee there will be more and more carbon waste being produced. In addition, the market demand for, for activated carbon and the vanadium pentoxide are both increasing at the, at the compound annual growth rate of 17% and 16% respectively. So, so the market drivers for activated carbon include stringent environmental regulations, widespread adoption in wastewater treatment plant and the increase in the industrial manufacturing. The, for the vanadium pentoxide, the growing demand for steel products for vanadium flow batteries, and as well as the improved manufacturing of important chemicals are the, the main market drivers for the vanadium pentoxide market. As we mentioned, we have well, our technology consists of two parts. In the first part, we separate the heavy metal from the carbon waste, and we further selectively convert the vanadium into vanadium pentoxide with a purity of 99% and above. So in another part for the purified carbon, we are using our own proprietary catalyst together with optimized heating program to make it more porous and also to surface functionality so that it has a strong absorption capacity towards both organic and inorganic proteins. So we have five one PCT applications with NUS and one invention disclosure with NUS. So we have already set up a 10 kg per batch small scale system in June Island. So our technology readiness level is seven. So we are using this small scale system for process optimization. And we are also using this system to produce enough samples for our customer to test. This is our launch product, Carbon SP. All the product specifications were tested based on ASTM standard. And uh, it has three applications with water treatment, air purification, and it can also be used as a battery electrode for energy storage systems. Because the mass ratio of the vanadium in the carbon waste is less than 1%. So currently we just focused on the commercialization of our carbon product at the initial stage of our business development. The sales of vanadium products could be another revenue stream at the later stage when we reach to full scale production. So this is our competitive advantages. As compared with, uh, as compared with the commercial activated carbon, the, uh, we have a similar LD number and a standard as methylene blue adsorption capacity. These two factors are commonly used to classify the quality of activated carbon. On top of that, we have doubled the adsorption capacity towards heavy metal proteins such as arsenic and selenium, which means if, we use, if you use our carbon, for the absorption of heavy metal proteins, we have a lot higher absorption efficiency with longer product life. Another advantage is that 
The conventional methods use raw material, use coal and biomass as a raw material for the production of aggregated carbon. They use high temp processing temperature, which is more than, which is higher than 800 degrees C for the activation of the carbon. So because we are using our own catalyst together with optimized heating program, we are able to lower down the processing temperature to less than 400 degrees C. Because the solid carbon could be converted to gaseous species at high temperature environment. Low processing temperature leads to high yield. That's why uh, the yield of our process could reach higher than 90, 90, uh, 85%. We believe that the combination of the, we believe that the nature of our raw material, our energy efficient process together with uh, high yield all contribute to high profitability, making us a strong competitor in the market. We have already received two letters of intent from one activated carbon trader and one end user. The projected potential revenue could reach more than 1.5 million Singapore dollars per year. We have also established partnership, strategic partnerships with SAMCOP. We are working together on the operation and optimization of the 10 kg per batch small scale system in Jewel Island. We are also in active discussion on the collaboration and investment in the pilot scale plant, in which they will supply us the raw material and they will also provide us the land and utilities. We have also joined the Singapore Water Exchange Program on the POB. So we plan to use their facilities as a test bed to explore the application of product for flow gas treatment. They will also be our potential end user. So we have two business models. The first one is end-to-end -end product sales. So in 2020, we have secured our pre-seed pre round investment. So we are going to use the funding for the, for the operation and optimization of the 10 kg per batch system. And we are raising the seed round this year for the construction of pilot scale plant. So we collect the raw material and then we convert this raw material into carbon products and the palladium products and we sell them into our end users. This is the first business model. So once we have proven that our, our uh, solutions are commercially viable using the pilot scale plant, then we will license our, te our technology to oil refineries or carbon waste producers or waste, man or waste management companies so that we can avoid the heavy capex production by licensing our technology. So we have been selected as one of the top 100 startups by Slingshot 2020, organized by Enterprise Singapore last year. And we have also been featured by Channel News Asia in the series, seeing young change makers in its non-running program on the red dot. So we acknowledge the patented technology was developed by SAMCOP US Corporate Laboratory. It's a 60 million Singapore Dollar Research Program jointly invested by National Research Foundation, SAMCOP, and AUS over a five-year period. And AUS group has provi have, have provided us a strong support in terms of business mentorship, industrial network, and collaboration, as well as funding support. We really appreciate it. And we also appreciate the continuous support from our strategic partner, SAMCOP. So on the collaboration for the of our 10 kg per system and also for the collaboration of the pilot scale plan in the future. We thank Li He, Dr. Arun, and Dr. Tai Minghao in Proof Wang Chihua's group for their contribution on the collaborative R&D works. So, so we are CB Eco Solutions. Join us and use carbon for a better environment. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Yao and Dr. Babu like to invite all of the attendees to ask questions. If you do have any, please do use the Q&A box for your questions and we will convey it to Dr. Yao and Dr. Babu. While we wait for questions from the attendees, I do have one question. So, uh, do you, would you, for, for your product, would you be able to claim carbon credits because you're recycling carbon waste? Yes, of course. 
So uh, because currently all the refineries are paying bit fee to dispose the carbon waste. In addition, this and this carbon waste is collected by waste management companies. So they they they, are, they will burn this carbon waste in their incineration plants. They have to pay carbon tax to the government. So then. Instead of burning and net fuel, we convert this carbon waste into something valuable so that we are able to, 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 to gain the carbon credit from this process. So, so have you included that in your revenue projection then? So we actually, we were told to be conservative when we do the value, the financial projection. So we did not include the, the carbon credit as well as the gate fee in our, in our financial projection. And even if we don't, Include this part. Our profit margin is also very promising. Great. We have one question uh, on the Q and A. It says, "Great work, Ziyi and Babu. Thank you. Thanks for the sharing. Wishing you all the best. How about the circular economy part? What is the longevity of use and the use potential? And the CBE plan to manage this as well?" So actually, uh, as Dr. Baba has presented, we can also regenerate this carbon waste by the chemical treatment. So, and actually, the longevity of use and reuse potential is also where all the carbons they can use up to even if it gets from the normal commercial carbon, they can use it for few cycles only. They can after after that they want to send to the incineration plant only. So we can use it when compared with the commercial one, the, both the reuse potential are exactly same only, and we no need to use some uh, strong acids like that. It's a uh, very mild acid is enough for the reusability. So you would not be sending the used carbon to the incinerator? Yes. So it can be reused for several, several times. times then eventually it will be sent for the incinerator. Uh, but, but would it be difficult to collect the used carbon because after you sell it to your buyers, they might be using it in different forms and you have to extract it and separate it? Yes, uh, that's uh, again, it's uh, another big uh, uh, stream. So now the, most of the companies, they are trying to reuse the carbon but again, they can reuse for certain certain time only. After that, the porosity will get damaged. Once the porosity get collapsed, we cannot reuse it for further. So that's a point. Good, thank you. I'd like to uh, invite the, all the attendees. If you do have any questions, please feel free to Last, please just type it into the Q and A box. Okay, there is another question. So, hi, Dr. Babu. How would you treat the used biochar after absorbing dye or other chemicals? Hi, hi, yeah. It depends upon the uh, the nature of the dyes only. If you use the organic or inorganic dyes, we are usually we used to use treat the mild acid, maybe HCl or any uh, sulfuric acid or any of it. Even compared to sulfuric acid, you can go for HCl or any of it. It's, uh, it's again, I said, it's depend upon the absorbing dye and the absorbing heavy metals only. Um, but we want to do the optimization for that. We, in our case, we tried with uh, mild HCl, 0.3 mole or something, and uh, sodium hydroxide and ammonium chloride. Sometimes we can go for ammonium chloride. It's a buffer, we can say. Then it will be, it's, uh, you, if you can try and we can find out this one. So for your production line of uh, 10 kilograms per batch, uh, how often, what, what is the run time for each batch? So based on our, uh, the calculation, the, 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 the processing time for each batch it roughly takes around roughly six to eight hours. You have to get the carbon waste from uh, from a source. To, to cover the yes, to cover the carbon waste to, to final products. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So just a question about this is the collection of the waste or the way you get it, would you require uh, licensing? Because these are, uh, I, would, I would assume these would be uh, toxic waste. Uh, so actually we are in collaboration with Suncorp. So we are working together in their, at their premise to, to conduct the op op operation and optimization on the system. So later on, our next step, our next milestone is to set up a pilot scale plan. We are also trying to, we are also applying for all the necessary lessons and permits for the pilot scale plan. Did you encounter any the challenges or regulatory hurdles in setting up. We have just initiated a discussion with NEA. <laughs> yeah, so I think yeah, maybe in the future we will have the issue. <laughs> Does the attendees have any other questions? Again, please feel free to, to type it into the QA box. For, for your company, Ziyi and Babu, uh, is it still under GRIP or have you graduated from GRIP? We have already graduated from GRIP. <laughs> yeah. So the so NUS... We are, yeah, we are working full time for our company. Yeah. But NUS has invested uh, in the company, right? Yes, yes. We have 100,000? 100,000, uh, yes, convertible note. That's good, great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully you'll be able to get the, the bigger seed funding for, for this. Yes. You talk with Enterprise Singapore? Uh, yes, we are applying for the uh, grant through some government agent, agency. And we have also, actually apart from GRIP, we also secured our pre-seed run from another external investor. There is a challenge to raise funding. funding yeah. uh, yes, yes. That is a part of the entrepreneurial <laughs> journey yeah. of uh, being able to be successful. Mm. Uh, it looks like there are no questions from the attendees. <laughs> this maybe is a. Uh, oh, okay, there's yeah, one. But one popped up. Okay. Uh, so the question is if we use mild hydrochloric acid to regenerate the biochar, and the pollutants will go to the uh, hydrochloric acid solution, how will you deal with this solution since the pollutants only move from one source to another? Uh, actually, uh, the initially if you are taking one liter solution with the contaminator, after using the HCL solution, the quantity will be very less. That's the point. We can uh, concentrate the solution. If we can reduce from one liter to maybe uh, 50 ml like that, once we fuse the HCL, the quantity of the, the treated one will be very less. That's a point. We cannot, 100%, we cannot, uh, it's not one is to one, it's one is to 10 like that. We can reduce the quantity of the base pollutant solution. That will be very useful. So you still have to dispose of the pollutants. Yes, yes, that's 100% we want to do like that. Exactly. At, at the end, we want to, again, we want to filter or dry it, and then again, we'll get the uh, like ash, like something we'll get at that loss. But we no need to waste a lot of water. That's a major uh, advantage we get from this. Great, thank you. thank you. Now it's almost five o'clock. I guess uh, the attendees are also uh, maybe getting tired towards the end of the day. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Yao and Dr. Babu for giving the very interesting presentation and wish them all the best in their, in their startup journey. And I'd like thank to you. thank all of the attendees for joining the webinar at NUS. Uh, hope you, all of you will have a very good day ahead and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Bye -bye. the great chance. Bye.